Welcome to the I Believe Podcast, an Acure Insight production, brought to you by Castle Biosciences. I'm your host, Danae Peterson, a fellow ocular melanoma survivor. Here on the podcast, we'll be sharing information and insights on treatments, research, and living with ocular melanoma. Castle Biosciences is a proud sponsor of this I Believe podcast. Castle Biosciences tests are designed to provide clinicians precise and personalized tumor information for the benefit of patient care. If you would like more information about how Castle is transforming the treatment of eye cancer, visit castletestinfo.com. Today I have with me Dr. Meredith McKean from Tennessee Oncology. Okay, so she's joining us all the way from Tennessee, which if you were uh, part of the I Believe conference in Nashville, then she was actually there in person with us and it was great to have her there. And we are glad that she is willing to be back with us and talk a little bit more about systemic therapies. But before I get into introducing her and getting into our conversation here, I just want to make you guys aware of kind of where we are with Steps for Sight. So for those of you who don't know, in the January month, last year and this year, we have done something called Steps for Sight for ocular melanoma. And what we do is we take steps every day. Everybody can register to walk virtually for ocular melanoma to just help raise awareness for obviously for our rare disease and also to raise money for research. And I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on where we ended with steps. We had over 42 million steps taken for ocular melanoma across the world with everyone who participated. I don't know the total number of people who participated, but I want to say it was close to four, like three or 400, somewhere in that range. We'll get final numbers to you in the next couple of weeks. And then our fundraising so far, because as you guys know, we can continue to raise money through, I believe it's the 14th of February. We have fundraising efforts so far up to, basically we're going to say 28,000 because it's 27,920. So that's close enough. We're saying 28,000. You guys, this is amazing. We do have a pool of money that is set aside specifically for research. And so we'll be able to add to that. And then um, the Melanoma Research Alliance is going to be doubling the donations raised with Steps for Sight to further our impact for a a future research project. So keep sharing, keep asking your communities, um, find new ways to ask your communities to contribute and just let's get the word out because we know that ocular melanoma needs more research. And we're really excited to be able to fund not just one research project coming up this year, but another one the following year. Stay tuned. We're going to be announcing more about the research and the projects that we've been working on. Just know that we do have a plan to to announce those. Um, We are just working on making sure we get their information out to you guys. So with that, I also want to introduce our speaker today. And we're going to be having a conversation. You guys are welcome to ask questions, but I want to just head this up with a disclaimer that if you do have questions, please make sure that they are generalized. We cannot do personal medical advice across Facebook and YouTube. I'm sorry, but we're so glad that Meredith is here with us. And Dr. McKean is great. She's so fun to listen to. And she's got a really, I feel like she's really easy to understand as far as doctors go. So we're grateful that she's here with us. Just a little about her. Dr. McKean is someone who received a bachelor's degree from Iowa State University and also ran cross country and track. And during her fellowship, she studied biomarkers for the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in metastatic melanoma, earning her an American Society of Clinical Oncology 2017 Young Investigator Award. She now serves as the director for melanoma and skin research program for the Melanoma and Skin Research Program at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute at Tennessee Oncology. So thanks again for being here, Dr. McKean. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for um, thanks for letting me join. Yeah, of course. So, just before we get into the nitty gritty of what we're going to talk about, tell us just briefly, you know, what drew you to medical oncology, and how did you get involved in the uveal melanoma community specifically? I've been interested in melanoma since my early days in in fellowship. You know, I think melanoma. I mean, quite fr- quite frankly, is you know personal to me. One of my mentors during medical school died from stage four melanoma, and you know, I think just, you know, like everyone having grown grown up and, you know, as a lifeguard, um, being outside in the summer, you know, the risks for cutaneous melanoma um, and having family members and myself, same risk factors for uveal melanoma, right? There's that personal connection. Um, when I was in fellowship, seeing patients um, coming in with melanoma to say, gosh, we just, we are just starting to understand immune therapy and how that can help um, patients with the melanoma, but there's still so much research, so much work we need to do. And so it just felt like I really personally connected with patients with melanoma. And that's led me to where I am today. So 
was recruited to Sarah Cannon um, to lead the melanoma program. And I think with my, my relationship with um, David Reichstein at Tennessee Retina in Nashville and my interest in doing research and clinical trials, I think my work with uveal melanoma and you know trying to help patients with uveal melanoma really grew from my interest in, in research and in my collaboration with him. Um, so it was a little unexpected necessary coming straight out of fellowship. You know, I'd worked at um, an MD Anderson. I'd worked with Dr. Patel there. Um, and, you know, she was a, a wonderful mentor. And then um, coming and joining Sarah Cannon and working with um, David Reichstein uh, to offer um, surveillance for patients, trying to uh, look at adjuvant clinical trials, and then having trials and options for patients with metastatic cancer. Um, it's just really become um, a, a a large part of my practice, um, trying to develop better treatments for patients with uveal melanoma. No, oh, that's, I mean, we're obviously, we're grateful to have another medical oncologist in the field that we can turn to and who is, um, I think centrally located more like as far as where you're located, um, you're a little more to the Midwest area, which I know will help a lot of those patients who, you know, potentially feel like their only option is to travel really far. So it's, it's good to be able to have options. And I'm glad that we can, can make sure that patients know about you and know about um, the Sarah Cannon Research Institute there that does have um, space and area for both research and you have clinical trial spaces, I'm assuming as well for uveal melanoma patients. Um, so that's awesome. Um, so let's, um, let's dive into systemic therapies. So we talked a little about this, um, just kind of in some general terms, we talked about this in, uh, the I Believe seminar. I know we were really heavily focused on ChemTrack and we were really heavily focused on just generally like how do you navigate a metastatic disease? So now let's um, let's narrow the focus a little to like what is a systemic therapy? Let's just start there. Sure. It's a great question and, and one that I get asked uh, whenever patients come for referrals. So systemic therapy, that just means a medication that's going throughout the body. So liver directed, those are treatments that um, based on either, you know, going in through the blood, um, blood vessels, um, primarily, you know, you're focusing treatment just on the liver. So whether that's surgery, radiation, or um, infusions, it's just into the liver. So systemic therapies just means a medication that either by pill or by an infusion, um, that medication is going throughout the body to try to treat the cancer wherever it is. Okay. So if we have systemic therapies available, um, what... What are kind of the conditions for using a systemic therapy with someone who is uh, presenting with metastatic disease? Mm -hmm. So I think the initial branch point is like standard of care. And, you know, as we've discussed, there really isn't a standard of care. ChemTrack is now available for patients with HLA AO2, uh, uh, um, HLA typing. Um, for other patients, it would be immune therapy that's been approved for melanoma of the skin. And so that's a, that. Those are treatment options that should be available with your local oncologist and should be available to patients. The other branch is clinical trials. And uh, clinical trials for patients with uveal melanoma, right now, most of those trials are, are still at phase one centers. So, um, you know, as you were saying, they aren't necessarily available in all the community clinics that are. Um, as close to patients as we'd like for them to be, because they are primarily still in earlier phases of development. And so they're at more major academic and clinical trial centers across the country. And so that does present challenges, obviously, with uh, for travel, um, financial reasons for, um, you know, maybe not being able to work as much, um, uh, you know, and just, just the challenges with doing that. I think a whole other podcast would be, you know, discussions with, you know, how the FDA is working to try to help make clinical trials more accessible, um, but we're not we're not quite there yet. And so right now, to participate in um, clinical trials for uveal melanoma, it generally does take reaching out um, to a specialist to find out what trials are available. And I will say the uveal melanoma. Um, medical community is very tight knit. So you know, if I have a patient that reaches out to me from the West Coast, I'll set them up and say, hey. Um, thank you for reaching out. We have this trial available, but it's also available in LA. So let me connect you and, and get you set up. So I do think there is a, a network in place that we try to help patients um, get treatments as close to home as possible. 
And I think that's so, that's so important. Um, especially like, like you said, within the community of doctors, like for you guys to be in the know and to know where are the trials accessible. Um, so what would you say to then a patient who maybe they're dealing with a, a medical oncologist who isn't as familiar with uveal melanoma, but they are trying their best to, you know, keep them close to home. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe they're being administered some cutaneous skin melanoma treatments and they only have liver, liver metastases. Um, what would you say to that? Like to a patient like that, would they, would they be better off pursuing something different um, initially because of just the liver presence or is systemic therapy something that you would recommend in that case? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish we had more data on this because I think uh, I think all of the experts in uveal melanoma would agree there's likely a role for both liver directed treatments and systemic therapy or medications. We don't know yet um, necessarily if there's a better sequence one way versus the other. A lot of it depends on access to treatment. Um, I think some of the other key things that we look at is what's the disease trajectory in the liver meaning, you know, have you had several scans that have shown kind of slow growth of those tumors in the liver, that maybe it is an opportunity to try a medication and and see if it would shrink down versus liver lesions that are growing more quickly. And we really, um, really should consider some liver directed treatment to try to stabilize the liver as soon as possible. Another consideration is um, patients that have disease outside the liver. So it's not uncommon for patients uh, to have disease in the bone, uh, um, have um, cutaneous lesions. So maybe lesions that you can feel, spots in the lungs, spots in the peritoneum or lining of the belly. Um, That doesn't necessarily mean that patients should directly go to systemic therapy, but it can be a consideration at any point in their treatment. Um, Hey, at what point should we be doing a medication that goes every place versus just focusing on the liver? So as far as um, monitoring goes and like locating those kinds of other, um, I guess, systemic areas of metastatic spread, like how, how do you as a, as an oncologist focus on making sure to get the most, the most information for your patient? Because I know a lot of patients, um, focus heavily on maybe a chest CT on a periodic level. And then they have, um, obviously liver MRIs, especially if you're dealing with metastatic, that's like the go-to is you need an MRI of the abdomen focused on the liver. Uh, but is, is there any other level of scanning that you think is important, um, in determining, you know, where do we need to focus for metastatic management? I mean, those are the, the those are the primary treatment or um, excuse me, imaging modalities. So CT scan of the chest, MRI of liver, abdomen, um, and then either CT of the pelvis. Um, I think that's probably the more more common um, versus an MRI. The other imaging modality, so imaging of the brain, um, is actually not standard of care. Um, we do know that patients can develop uh, brain metastases or spots of cancer that that travel to the brain. It's not um, usually done routinely for patients. So if if patients start having any symptoms, you know, um, headaches, lightheadedness, um, un- feeling unsteady on their feet, those would be reasons to potentially get imaging. Um, I do see patients develop brain metastases later in their metastatic disease course, um, and in some clinical trials will require imaging of the brain. But that's not necessarily something that we standardly do, especially early on in a patient's disease. Um, Another imaging modality um, that can be helpful is a PET scan. And so I think a lot of patients have heard about a PET scan. A PET scan is a radio-labeled glucose that, you know, in there's a lot of um, a lot of think misconceptions about it. The idea behind behind using glucose is just that it goes to areas of rapid metabolism. So it's not specific to cancer, but it can be helpful in tracing down areas of of tumor. And so this can be helpful sometimes for patients I find um, that potentially have a spot in the bone um, that maybe isn't captured as well in a CT scan of the chest and MRI. Um, And so it can be helpful sometimes to find several different uh, spots in the bone or for patients that have these metastases underneath the skin that they can feel. The challenge is, is it's not very helpful looking at the liver at all because there's normal uptake in the liver. And so it's not something I find helpful to do routinely. Um, and that's, I really fall back on the CT scan of the chest and the MRI. The other thing that I tell patients too with the PET scan is the, the cuts, the images are further apart. So you just don't get as much detail as you do with a regular CT scan. Um, 
I'll add one other imaging modality that can be helpful is MRIs of the spine. So if a patient is ha does have bone metastases and you know is having pain in a location that we we've picked up incidentally on a, C a CT scan of the chest or MRI of the liver, it can be helpful to get an MRI of the spine just to, to get better clarification. Exactly where is that lesion? Is it pressing on any nerves or, or it, um, pressing on the spinal cord at all? That can be really helpful information. So, um, I mean, obviously nothing about all of this is awesome, but that was awesome information. Um, but, um, so for systemic spread, so something like, is that, is that the correct term? Like systemic meaning through the whole body system or is, or is systemic not quite the right word? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a fair description. You know, another... we've got like liver spread and then we've got, I guess, out of the liver spread. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can, you can say, um, disease spread outside the liver. I think yeah. that's. Yeah, that, that's probably a little more accurate. So like for disease that's spread outside the liver, um, you're, you're, um, I guess, do you typically see it in conjunction with liver metastases or are there some occasions where you might have someone who has something just outside the liver, like maybe in the bones or in, I don't know, some other random organ or some other random location, but it hasn't manifested at all in the liver. Um, is that common? Um, or, you know, is that even, is that even something that happens? Mm -hmm. It it does happen. It's it's far more rare than than having disease at time of diagnosis in the liver. Um, so, you know, you can have disease isolated just to maybe the, some spots in the lungs, um, or rarely I've seen patients that have developed um, uh, metastases underneath the skin that they can feel that they feel a bump or a mass growing, um, and had very very small disease. Um, uh, small metastases in the, in the liver. So you can, um, what I tell my patients on surveillance though, is that, Hey, I want you to let me know in between these visits, if you develop any, you know, new pain, new symptoms that aren't going away. So common things are still going to be common. If you get a new cough, um, and you have a fever and everyone else in your household has COVID, you probably have COVID, but if you have a cough, that's not going away. Um, and, and you know you don't have any other good answers. Don't wait six months for that next appointment with me. Go ahead and call me, and, and we can always evaluate it. Um, but common things are still common. It's it's still very rare for a patient uh, to develop metastatic disease, and it's picked up at, at, because of having symptoms or having lab abnormalities versus something that we pick up on imaging. Gotcha. Um, that's definitely important, like an important distinction. Um, so as far as like our systemic therapies go, you mentioned that the, you feel like there is. Uh, becoming a little bit more prevalence for this idea that there's room for both liver directed mm -hmm. and systemic at various different times or sometimes in conjunction with each other. Um, do you know of any clinical trials that specifically focus on utilizing both or that, um, like I know I can think of a couple, I, I can't remember. I know there's the Perio one trial and I think there's a phase one Replimune trial that's now open in a few sites, but they're, they're focused on administering something that is typically administered systemically but they're administering it using technology to liver directed or directly to a tumor. Um, do you, do you um, have any other, I guess, insights on some of those, some of those types of trials? Yeah, we don't have any open here at Sarah Cannon. And I know the different clinical trial opportunities for the combination of systemic therapy and liver directed um, do tend to open, close, go and pause as with any clinical trial. So I, I do agree some of the trials that you mentioned. Um, I know there's several centers that have some, um, some combination therapies available. And I think that's going to be a really interesting area of investigation. And um, I think worth evaluating for patients, you know, historically, I think the challenge has been that a lot of medications are processed in the liver. And so the challenge can be delivering intense, local therapy to the liver can cause inflammation. And for a, a short period of time, it doesn't, the liver doesn't process medications as well. And so if you're giving a medication at the same time, that can be challenging. Um, but I think we've really learned a lot um, from earlier studies with immune therapies. Um, and so I think it's, it'll be really interesting to see how some of those clinical trials progress and see if that's another great option for our patients. Okay. Um, so you mentioned immune therapies and you kind of talked a little at the beginning of this and I want to go more into depth, like in a future podcast episode about this, but if you had to kind of define, like I know systemically we can have, um, you know, 
traditional cancer treatment, you hear people getting chemotherapy through like an IV of some kind, or they take a pill. Um, so that we know there's chemotherapy and there's immune therapy. Can you kind of help us define what's the difference between the two of them as far as like having a systemic therapy goes? What are the similarities um, as far as how they're administered? Mm -hmm. So I'll say chemotherapy should rarely be used. Systemic administration, so like chemotherapy through an IV should be rarely used for a patient with uveal melanoma. Um, chemotherapy works by um, trying to target areas of, of the cell cycle, uh, you know, of cells growing, dividing, and replicating. Um, and so the chemotherapy in general is not specific to cancer cells. That's why, you know, if you know other patients that have received chemotherapy, you know, may lose their hair, have, you know, trying to control nausea, um, and you, you can have a lot of side effects due to the effect of the chemotherapy on your normal cells, and it's the cells that are rapidly dividing that are affected the most. Immune therapy, you know, the medications that you can receive, like Opdebo, Yervoy, in, in, your, in the clinic, those actually don't target the tumor at all. Those are trying to stimulate the immune system to be more active and to try to go around and seek, seek out proteins that shouldn't be there. And the hope is that by activating the immune system, it might recognize that that tumor shouldn't be there. And the reason why historically we felt like it hasn't worked quite as well in uveal melanoma as, say, melanoma of the skin is because melanoma of the skin looks very very different than your normal cells, whereas uveal melanoma still looks pretty similar. It's just developed some of these mutations, some of these mistakes that tell it to keep growing. And so that can be that's that can be challenging for the immune system then to recognize that that tumor shouldn't be there. Now, ChemTrack, that's a little bit different because it's actually um, not only kind of grabbing onto the immune cells, but also onto a protein that's expressed in the tumor. But I would still consider that an immune therapy. And then um, I'd say there's there's kind of two other classes of, of, of different systemic therapies or medications that are under development. One's called targeted therapies. And so some clinical trials uh, are looking at targeted therapies for what you've, you know, GNAQ, GNA11, BAP1, SF3B1. So this is information that most patients with metastatic disease should should have. Um, it's, it would have been testing done on their tumor to see what are the specific drivers of their cancer. And the idea is, so like GNAQ11, we know most patients, their tumors have developed those mutations, and that's kind of a defining mistake in that DNA um, for uveal melanoma. And these medications try to go in and turn off that signaling. So that's what we would consider targeted therapy. And then one other class I'll just mention because there are some clinical trials is what's called antibody drug conjugates. And so that is that is um, a type of chemotherapy. So what it means is that it's a, a treatment that has chemotherapy, but it also has a linker uh, to attach to something in the tumor. And so the idea is to try to take that chemotherapy directly into the tumor. And so we're starting to see some clinical trials using that technology uh, for patients with uveal melanoma. So there's several different categories. So I would say chemotherapy, immune therapy, targeted therapy, and then um, the antibody drug conjugates, um, that all of those um, are different categories of medications that are under development or are options available to any patient with uveal melanoma. Thank you. That was, I mean, that was really great. I felt like that was a really good way to like kind of summarize what is out there. So how would a patient evaluate, say, two or three different types of systemic therapies with their doctor? Um, what would be kind of some of the questions that you would be asking when looking at the data of these clinical trials or when looking at, you know, maybe the response rate of the patients who have already used uh, something that's a little more, quote unquote, standard of care, but maybe obviously like it's not perfect standard of care, but it's just, it's just there. I think one of the main questions that we had was like, okay, I have liver mets. Why is my doctor not using ChemTrack as a frontline treatment? That's definitely a question that comes up. So I guess just to kind of hammer this home again, uh, can you just speak briefly to what are, the, what are the reasons for using something like ChemTrack where we know it targets something specific versus using a liver-directed therapy or doing both? And now that we have ChemTrack approved as an FDA-approved treatment, you know, do you, have you ever um, heard of or used both of them in conjunction like with each other? Great question. So the first one I'll answer is, you know, why should I be doing liver-directed first versus something like ChemTrack first? And 
we don't we don't have a great answer and so that's why you know i think it's worthwhile for each individual patient to just have that conversation with their doctor like i was saying before it may depend on how aggressive is the disease in the liver do you have disease elsewhere is there anything that looks concerning that you know trying to do aggressive liver directed therapy might be challenging, you know, lower platelets, your bilirubin's elevated. So there's a lot of different considerations. We know there was some retrospective data, uh, meaning um, Thomas Jefferson looked back at patients that had previously retreat, received treatment over several decades. And it was a study that demonstrated that it looked like patients that got both systemic therapy and liver directed therapy did best. And so that's why we feel like, hey, you know, patients with uveal melanoma were likely going to be using both local therapy and systemic therapies to try to manage their disease. I'd say a lot of patients that I um, help and work with in collaboration with other centers, patients may receive some liver-directed therapy and then come do a trial and then, you know, go get some more liver-directed therapy and then go back on medication. And so it's it's fairly common in, in my experience to see patients go back and forth um, between the two options, Depend, but it also, you know, depends on their disease. The challenge is, is that ChemTrack, while we're excited about it, the response rates are, are still pretty low. So if it's a patient that has disease that's, that's growing more quickly, um, you know, Kim track, we don't know if that's necessarily the best answer to start with. And the liver we're most concerned about. So if, if you have an option to do liver directed therapy, you know, you have the specialists and they've been able to evaluate your liver and offer it, then that could be a reasonable first step and then follow up with Kim track later, uh, you know, if, if you can get that locally um, versus a clinical trial. So there's a, a long story short, there's no one right answer. I think there's value to both medication and liver-directed treatment, and we hope someday we have some really fantastic medications we can use. So we would say, hey, start with these, and then we can you know, do later control with, uh, with the liver as we need to in the future. That makes total sense to me um, as far as just kind of just trying to like figure it out as you go, which I know that can be such a frustrating thing for patients to hear. Uh, but I think just, just having that continual reminder that like the doctors are the guinea pigs as much as the patients are in some ways, like you guys are, you guys are figuring this out for the first time with each patient, because every patient looks different. Every patient's metastatic spread presents differently. And while we would love to be able to say, try something like maybe a little more experimental with an FDA approved treatment and something side along with it. There's also the risk of, I mean, I guess I'm just, I'm just interpreting this as like, if I were a physician, there's the risk of, well, my patient really has to come first. And this idea of like, I don't want to harm my patient. I don't want to have them get too sick. I don't want to have them have adverse responses to something that I don't know how it's going to interact. Um, so I can see that being one of those troubling things as a, as a doctor that like, you can't necessarily say, well, yes, we can do chemoembolization and we can also do chem trap at exactly the same time because you might know exactly how or you might not know how they're going to react for that specific patient and there's just like you said not enough data supporting you know what are those look like together yeah and i i guess i hadn't commented on that i mean i'll say i've had patients that have been on chem track and had you know disease stability but maybe there's um, one larger lesion that's growing, um, and so have done liver-directed therapy and then come back to ChemTrac. Um, I have not done it concurrently. Uh, you know, I've oh, th those patients have always taken a break um, because we don't have good data for that. Um, and the the challenge is, like I, like I said, with liver therapy, you can have inflammation in the liver, and so we're not we don't know for certain that it's safe to give both at the same time. I'm, I'm sure that's under um, evaluation and we'll potentially. Yeah. No, for sure. Hopefully we'll have that answer soon. Yeah. But I think the, the, I'll just, the, my one last takeaway from that is our goal with cancer is to personalize a patient's treatment. And so that's why there isn't one specific algorithm that, you know, you can Google uh, metastatic uveal melanoma and here's exactly what we should do because each patient we're looking at, you know, what does your imaging look like? How are you feeling? What other medical conditions do you have? What's driving your tumor? And so you should hopefully take a little comfort in, you know, that's why you go see a doctor. That's why you have a team taking care of you is because they're looking at you individually and saying, here's what should be done. No, that's, that's such a good point. And, um, and I think just, I mean, as a, you know, as a patient myself, like that's, that's reassuring, like just to know that my doctor is looking at 
what do I need as a patient, not just what does the general uveal melanoma community usually take or need? Uh, because like you said, like we're, we're kind of not able to define a what does everyone usually need because everyone is so different. Um, so as we as we end and just offer a few minutes for questions, um, I'm going to open it up for questions just so that if we have a couple come through, um, then I can snag those off of Facebook. So as you guys are listening uh, in the audience, feel free to drop a question. Again, just remembering no personal medical advice can be given, but we can do generalized questions if you guys have some more. Um, I do have one final question though, for just my own thinking. Uh, you mentioned, like we talk a lot about the liver and the role of the liver and what we're looking, you know, the health of the liver. So can you just kind of give us a, a brief overview of like, why is the liver so important in our bodies? And why is it such a threat to our overall health? Because, you know, outwardly, most people with liver metastases, they look physically, they look fine until suddenly they don't. So why is the liver kind of this, this key driving organ in the whole body function? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the blessing and the curse for uveal melanoma is that the disease, uh, most of the diseases in the liver, you know, generally patients for a long period of time don't have any symptoms. Um, patients oftentimes develop symptoms potentially later in the disease because um, the blood flow, you know, the, the liver, I, I like to say is the dump truck of the body. It's really trying to clean out the blood, get rid of toxins. And so it's getting all the blood flow back from the lower half of the body up um, back up to the heart. And so what can happen is if you develop, as you develop metastases there, you can get um, the blood flow getting backed up into the belly, um, that blood flow into the spleen. Some of the platelets can stick in there. You can get swelling in the legs, but for a long period of time, patients, patients don't have any symptoms, but the challenge is, like I said, as the, the organ that processes um, medications, toxins in the body. Um, the concern is that when the liver stops working very well, it's not processing, you know, the breakdown of those red blood cells. That's why we're always watching the bilirubin carefully, because that can be a sign that the liver isn't processing those. If it's not processing medications, the toxins in the body, um, patients can become confused. And so the liver is most important because of its role. Um, it has a lot of different roles, but the main one is processing the different toxins, medications in the body. Um, and we can't do a transplant, right? Because the, the cancer is still elsewhere in the body. Patients have asked me that. Um, the challenge with trying to do surgery is that there's still likely cancer left. Um, so we don't have a good way to replace the liver. You know, we can, you can give you oxygen to help the lungs. We can do dialysis to help the kidneys. We can't replace what the liver does for us. Um, and so that's why, because the cancer likes to reside in the liver, that's what makes it so challenging um, and so important. So this may sound like a little bit of an overkill question, but I do see this question pop up with patients sometimes. There's, you know, kind of like what you meant, you mentioned, there's a big desire of like, well, I have a couple lesions here. Why can't you just slice off half my liver and it'll regrow? Like, doesn't the liver regenerate? Um, that's what we hear in these TV shows all the time is that the liver can regenerate. You can get a liver transplant. Um, you know, you can donate a portion of your liver, like things like that. Obviously, we're not going to donate portions of our livers to anyone, um, but why is doing a liver transplant, like a complete replacement of the liver, out of the question um, as far as uveal melanoma is concerned? Mm -hmm. So we anticipate when uveal melanoma metastasizes to liver, it's, it's spread through the blood. And so even if you do the dramatic, uh, you know, large surgery of removing a liver, there's likely going to be cancer left. And then the challenge is if you have a liver transplant, not only have you just done a large surgery that's going to take a long time to recover from, but you're going to be on immunosuppression. You're going to be telling that immune system to calm down. And right, we talked about, we use medications to stimulate the immune system. And so by doing a transplant or, you know, routinely doing large surgeries, removing um, the liver for these patients, that's really counterintuitive to everything we know about treating this cancer. So um, putting patients through a large surgery that they can't do liver direct therapy um, for a period of time, if that cancer comes back in the transplanted liver, you can't do trials, um, you can't do most systemic therapy because you need time to heal. Then you're doing immunosuppression, trying to tell the immune system to calm down. And, and so, and then, and then you know that there's still cancer left. And so that's why patients in general with, with cancer aren't 
th that transplant isn't a treatment option um, because we don't think it would actually help patients. We think it would just cause more harm. No, that totally makes sense to me. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we answer that because I know that comes up for patients that they just, you know, like, yeah. just get it out, like take it all out. The same as like, you know, like we have the eye taken out, like, can't we just take the liver? Um, and so it, 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 I think it helps, especially to have that explanation that it's like, okay, yes, it could maybe help, but because you already explained the function of the liver is to filter everything. It filters your blood. It filters the toxins in your blood. If it's filtering the blood and there's cancer in the liver, it would it would totally make sense that it would be passing into the blood or you know come from the blood. Well, because it has to travel from the eye to to the liver somehow. It goes through the blood flow. Um, then it would it would make total sense that you know just replacing it doesn't fix anything. It it just mm -hmm. creates a new house, um, a new house for these cells to find. Um, I'm looking to see if I have any questions coming through. So I just, just to be respectful of your time and also with my time, um, I am going to head, going to go ahead and say that we're going to end for the day. Um, but I really feel like this was such a, a powerful, um, just a powerful discussion. And I hope that patients got a lot out of this. And if you guys do have questions as you're listening to this live uh, recording, or you're listening to the podcast episode, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and if I don't have the answer myself or um, can't look it up, then I will pass it on to Dr. McKean and see if she can answer that. Um, but Dr. McKean, as we kind of close out, do you have anything that you'd like to say just to kind of just to end? Yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, you know, always happy to, um, you know, help any patient um, with uveal melanoma or answer any questions. And I think the, the one thing I'll add is that I think it's really important to have a, a local oncologist that you're working with. And that local oncologist can always, you or that local oncologist can always reach out to uh, a uveal melanoma specialist for questions. You know, I think one of the things, comments that you made earlier, I, I think, um, you know, patients may sometimes not know if their provider knows as much about uveal melanoma. I've never had a, a problem working with a local oncologist to try to help help with the care. And I think all the um, those of us that see a lot of patients with uveal melanoma would, would agree with that. So feel free to reach out. We're all here to help um, and, and really just try to get the best personalized care for each patient. Oh, and I like, I'm trying to find trying to find which episode it was, but Dr. Moser actually did an episode with us early on in the podcast. Oh, it's episode 23 on the I Believe podcast. And he actually talks about why it's important to see if possible a uveal melanoma oncologist, but he also references what you said that just, if you don't have access to one and you're, say you're just having monitoring scans done, um, everything is okay. You're stable no evidence of disease, but you are still wanting to make sure that you're staying in the know, that you're staying in connection with someone who can have an action plan put into place if needed. Um, mm -hmm. Then some of the best ways you can do that is just to ask your oncologist to communicate with someone who's a uveal melanoma specialist, like Dr. McKean, Dr. Moser, Dr. Carvajal, Dr. Sato, and Dr. Orloff. Um, trying to think of who else I can pull out of my hat. Um, I, that's, that's like the first couple that come straight to mind. Um, but I know there's a, there's a host of other ones. And I think another thing that's really interesting to me, um, I was talking to a pharmaceutical rep and he was just sharing that as he's been coming with data about, uh, an upcoming clinical trial that they have, that he's had cutaneous melanoma, like experts and oncologists who are saying, Hey, this is all great for cutaneous, but like, do you have anything for uveal? Because I have some patients with uveal. And so he, he was really just, he was floored by that because he think he, in his estimation, he's like, that's such a good thing for the oncology community to now not just be saying, Oh, you have melanoma. I know what to do. Like, and to treat you like a cutaneous melanoma patient, which, you know, that doesn't work. Um, because like you said, on a cellular level, uveal melanoma behaves differently. But to then have oncologists now understanding in the medical oncology field of melanoma that, hey, this one's different and we still need to work on this. And so therefore, I'm going to ask about that. Um, I think those are those are some, to me, that's an indication of just the work that's being done behind the scenes by you guys, by the research teams, um, you really just by everyone in the uveal melanoma community, ocular and medical. Um, you guys have done such an amazing job of just making this something that is on people's minds. Well, I think we, we all want better treatments and options for patients with uveal melanoma. And so I think a lot of work to do, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we are seeing progress. We had one really good question come in on Facebook. So we're going to ask this question really fast. Um, can you start an immunotherapy as a preventative or an adjuvant therapy before it appears to have metastasized instead of waiting to follow up scans? Um, so I guess there's two scenarios here. One would be you've had your eye treated and can you do something adjuvantly for whole body and 
has that been proven to be, you know, any level of effective? And two, you know, if you have one liver metastasis or something small that was treated and you're now disease free, is there room for systemic therapy as a preventative there? Yeah, great question. So there is a study, I think it's close to enrollment now, um, that was has been evaluated in a number of different centers looking at that exact question for patients after diagnosis of a high-risk tumor in the eye. And so um, I think we will have data coming out in the next couple of years looking at patients with high-risk disease that have had treatment of the primary tumor in the eye that then go on to receive the combination of Yervoy Opdivo and continue that Opdivo for a year. Um, we're going to have data um, in that space because there's been an ongoing clinical trial for those patients. Um, so right now there's no standard of care. There's no data to show that it's helpful. Um, and I think the challenge for doing that in that, in that setting um, off of a clinical trial is that we know that combination has a high side effect or toxicity rate. And so the challenge is, is we don't know if it's going to benefit patients, but we know there's going to be a high um, number of side effects. So um, I don't recommend that for patients um, that are treated off of a clinical trial, but um, once we have that data from the trial, then, then we'll know, is, is that worthwhile for patients? The other scenario is a little different, like you said, for patients that have a known metastatic recurrence um, and, and have maybe received um, isolated treatment to that lesion. The challenge is, is like I said, we anticipate that the spread of this disease is by the blood and that there's likely some um, little cancer cells potentially elsewhere. So I think it can be reasonable um, to consider that and discussing that with your physician. We don't have any data. Again, we just know for patients that have lesions um, that are present, we know the, the rate of response, so the dramatic shrinkage greater than 30%, that rate's about 15 to 20% for the combination of your boy Opdivo. So not great, but better than nothing. Um, the challenge can be in that situation, you don't have disease that we can follow to see, hey, are you is it working or not? Um, but one caveat to that is we actually wonder for uveal melanoma long-term, like is imaging actually the best way to evaluate patient's disease? As we're doing um, more studies looking at uh, testing the blood of patients and looking at cells circulating the blood, long-term, that may be another way that we can um, track patients and really try to diagnose recurrence early or for patients that have negative scans, can we see any changes in um, the blood levels of these cancer cells and maybe we should do treatment. So all that to say, um, in the setting where you don't have any known um, cancer, uh, that is, you've just had a primary tumor treated in the eye, there was a study evaluating that, that you know they're continuing to follow up on patients and so we'll have data in that space. So I wouldn't recommend doing that off of clinical trial for patients that have had cancer come back and um, are technically a stage four diagnosis, but have had treatment of a primary tumor. I've seen a number of patients and it can be worthwhile to consider, should we do immune therapy to try to prevent um, and that cancer from really um, growing elsewhere? Um, I think that's a um, still a data-free area, but I think there's a little bit more rationale um, and worthwhile to potentially discuss with your doctor if that's right for you. Oh, that I mean, that makes total sense to me. So thank you. Thanks for helping answer that question. So this was the follow-up, follow-up to Systemic Therapy 101 with the caveat of PS. Here's, here's one more. Uh, um, thank you again. We will talk to you next time. Thank you so much for joining us today on the I Believe podcast brought to you by Castle Biosciences. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you're so inclined, send this episode over to friends, family, and share on your social media to help spread awareness around OM. If you have a moment, leave us a brief review or consider making a donation to the links in the show notes to keep our podcast going. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Acure Insight. We'll see you next time on the I Believe podcast.